Again, welcome to everyone. You know, the world seems to be changing rapidly today, but we don't seem to be going in the right direction. Wherever the world is heading, it's certainly not toward God. We see things on the news that continue to shock us. I had someone tell me earlier this week that they believe that Christ would return very soon, based on the current world events they're seeing. In fact, many people today claim to be seeing signs of the return of Jesus Christ. But how will we know if the return of Christ is imminent? Well, there's only one place where we can find the answer to that question. Of course, we can look at our Bibles. We can look to see what our Bibles tell us about the end of the age. We can look to see what our Bibles tell us about the return of Jesus Christ. And indeed, our Bibles have much to say about the end of the age and the return of Jesus Christ. Now, one place we can find the signs of these soon coming events would be in Matthew 24. Let's go ahead now. Let's go ahead and turn over to Matthew 24, verse 3, if you would. That's Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. In Matthew 24, verse 3, we see the disciples directly ask Jesus about the sign of his second coming and the end of the age. And that's the question we're trying to answer today. So, is there a sign that would tell us when the end will come? Again, Matthew 24, verse 3. Well, by the way, uh, we can also find signs relating to the end and the return of Christ in places like Mark 13, Luke 21, as well as many other places in the Bible. But today, of course, we're looking at Matthew 24. So again, Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? The word world here is the Greek word 165 in Strong's, and it means an age. The disciples weren't asking Jesus about the end of the world, if you will, but rather the end of the age, the end of the rule of Satan, and the beginning of the rule of Christ. There may be some out there that don't believe that Satan is the ruler of the world today. I know I've heard that. If you'd like some biblical references about this, I have five for you if you're taking notes today, so let me list those for you. You can take a look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 2, 1 John 5, verse 19, and three locations in John. We have John 12, verse 31, John 14, verse 30, and John 16, verse 11. Let's go back to Matthew 24, verse 4 now. now in verse 4, Jesus begins to answer his disciples about the signs of the end. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now the very first thing that Jesus says to his disciples is for them not to be deceived. So obviously there will be a lot of deception going on when the time grows short. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. People are saying that Jesus is the Christ, and they're correct. But some are coming in his name, calling themselves Christians, and usurping his authority, and they're deceiving many today. Do we maybe see some leaders out there deceiving their followers today? You bet. Verse 6. And you shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. The end is not yet. Although we're certainly hearing of wars and rumors of war today, wars today, these are not exactly the signs of the actual end of the age and the return of Jesus Christ. These are signs we will, we will see leading up to his return, but the end is not yet. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation. The word nation here is the Greek word 1484 in Strong's. It's the word ethnos from which we get our English word ethnicity. And it means a race or a tribe. So we see that's race rising against race. Are we seeing this today? Well, I believe so. Let's continue in verse 7. And kingdom against kingdom. 
The word kingdom here refers to a realm or a political entity, a country. So do we have any countries that aren't getting along and playing nice today? I think we have plenty. Let's continue on to verse 7. There shall be famines. I'd like to read a part of an article from the website oxfam.org. That's O-X-F-A-M dot O-R-G. Here's what it says, quote, Today, the world stands on the brink of unprecedented famines. About, thir- I'm sorry, about 30 million people are experiencing alarming hunger. Severe levels of food insecurity and malnutrition in northeastern Nigeria, South Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. And of course, sadly, there are many other locations experiencing famine today. Here, we're seeing grocery chains stockpile food right here in the United States. Have you heard about that? They're stockpiling food as they anticipate food here to increase in price and shortages soon to become more common. Drought in the West, transportation problems, and even a plague of grasshoppers are threatening the United States' food supply. That swarm of grasshoppers, it's so thick that they can be seen on weather radar, just like the locusts we've been seeing in the Middle East on radar. We've had a plague of rats in Australia eating everything up, and we've had locusts in Africa as well as the Middle East. We've had too much rain in some places and not enough in others. Devastating crops all around the world. Famine is increasing worldwide. Let's continue on. The next item is pestilences. Of course, we're dealing with a pandemic as I speak. And COVID-19 isn't the only pestilence out there today. There are many others. Let's go ahead here. Next thing on the list is earthquakes in divers or various places. Not only do we seem to be having more earthquakes worldwide, but we seem to be having them in locations where they typically have not been often occurring, at least not in the past. And of course, remember that the Greek word seismos, although translated as earthquake in verse 7, means any disturbance of the ground or the air. So we're also looking for things like volcanic activity, sinkholes, mudslides and hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, etc. All of which seem to be increasing in number and intensity. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now a better translation would be the beginning of birth pangs. Let me read Matthew 24 verse 8 and a few other translations. I'll read first from the easy-to-read version. It says, These things are only the beginning of troubles, like the first pains of a woman giving birth. The contemporary English version. But this is just the beginning of troubles. And the International Standard Version reads, But all these things are only the beginning of the birth pains. The signs Jesus has been talking about up to this point are signs in the end signs that the end is drawing near. But they're not the actual signs of the end itself. The end is not yet. Verse 9. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended. Well, I certainly think we're seeing that today. And betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, up to now, most of the signs Jesus is giving us are of things that we will see as we approach the end. But notice that the very next verse speaks speaks directly of the end coming. When we see the sign in verse 14 be fulfilled, then the end shall come. Let's take a look. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So before we read that we'll see wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We'll see famines and pestilences and earthquakes. 
But these are just the beginning of sorrows. As we said, the beginning of sorrows is better translated as birth pangs. Now, birth pangs can get underway, but that doesn't mean that delivery is immediate, just that it's getting somewhat close. But the birth pangs will come closer together and become more intense. They indicate a soon coming birth, but they don't pinpoint the exact time. But in verse 14, we're told that when this gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout the world, then the end shall come. And then, of course, Jesus Christ will return. This isn't exactly something leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. This tells us exactly when Jesus Christ will return. This is a sign that is very specific. This is a very important sign of His coming. So today I'd like to concentrate on this single but very significant sign of the end of the age, as given to us by our Savior. I believe that most of the world completely misunderstands what Jesus meant, what he was saying in verse 14. Let's look at this verse again and see what it says. Again, Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. According to Jesus Christ, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout the world, then the end shall come. You know, I previously believed that this had already happened. I believe that practically the whole world knew the name of Jesus Christ and probably has for some time. But Christ hasn't returned. So what's wrong? This used to really bother me. Missionaries have taken their knowledge of Jesus Christ throughout the world for actually many hundreds of years. Many have risked their very lives to do this. I've heard some of their stories personally. I give them very much credit for their courage and her desire to spread the news about what Jesus did for us, how he loves us. Missionaries have given so much of themselves, and as I said, often literally risked their lives to tell people about Jesus. Now over time, they've preached Jesus to millions, maybe a billion across the globe. They've worked very hard to tell people about Jesus Christ. So this has been going on for quite some time. What about radio? What about radio? There's local radio, you know, radio stations that are nearby us, and many of those have Christian programming on them at different times. In addition, shortwave radio. How many have a shortwave radio? Okay. Shortwave radio can be heard around the world. There isn't a location on earth that shortwave radio can't reach. Many around the world have a shortwave radio, or at least a friend or a relative that does. Now, I've kept a shortwave radio at my home for many years. Oh, they aren't quite as popular in the United States as they are in other parts of the world. But if you were to listen to shortwave radio, what is the most common thing you will hear? What is all over shortwave radio? The one thing. That's preachers preaching about Jesus Christ. You cannot scan the shortwave bands without hearing about Jesus Christ. And this has been going on for many, many years. Television? Most cable and satellite systems have at least some Christian programming. Streaming services and over-the-air TV stations do as well. And, of course, we have the Internet. You'll find myriads of preachers preaching about Jesus Christ on the Internet. So we have all this going out. We know that Muslims have heard of Jesus. The Chinese and even the North Koreans have heard of Jesus Christ, although they often struggle with underground churches but they're not a stranger to his name. Now, not everyone in the world believes in Jesus Christ. Not everyone in the world has a personal relationship with Christ. But after hundreds of years of missionary visits, radio broadcasts covering the entire globe, and the Internet that's now reaching the most remote parts of the earth, people have heard of Jesus Christ. I think today we'd have trouble finding people who have not heard the name of Jesus or Jesus, or Yahshua, or Yehoshua, no matter how we pronounce it. In other words, I think it'll be very difficult to find someone who hasn't at least heard about Jesus Christ. So then, why hasn't the end come? With all the missionaries, radio, television, and the internet carrying messages about Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ still unknown to the world? 
No, I believe that practically the entire world has heard of Jesus Christ. As I said, likely for some time now. Amos 3, verse 7. Would you turn with me to Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Amos 3, verse 7. So what is it that Christ is waiting for? Why doesn't he return as he said he would in Matthew 24, verse 14? Why didn't he return years ago? Assuming, of course, that his name was carried into the whole world, as I believe. Let's take a look at Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. I'd like to reread that in the Bible and basic English version. It says, Certainly the Lord will do nothing without making clear his secret to his servants, the prophets. And also in the Good News Bible. The sovereign Lord never does anything without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. I'm sure most of us remember that God revealed to Jonah that he was about to destroy Nineveh if they didn't repent. You remember that? Jonah had a message from God to deliver to the people of Nineveh. Now, Jonah was a prophet sent by God who would tell the people of Nineveh what God was about to do before he actually did it. Now, Jonah had a few issues along the way. We know about that. He wasn't exactly eager to deliver God's message. In fact, he got thrown off a ship, a ship and was eaten by a large fish. Still, the prophet Jonah eventually told the people of Nineveh what was about to happen. Now, in this case, the people of Nineveh, they weren't going to be blindsided by their sudden and rather swift destruction. A prophet sent by God would tell them what was coming first. And as we know, they repented and God ended up sparing them. But who or what is a prophet? Am I a prophet? Are you a prophet? Those might like, sound like silly questions to some of us, but really, what is a prophet? I looked up the definition of the word prophet at dictionary.com. Here's her definition. It says they are a person who speaks for God or by divine inspiration. Again, a person who speaks for God or by divine inspiration. We have two possibilities for those who might be called a prophet. Now, when most people hear the word prophet, they immediately think of someone that God has given some special insight to, that he's spoken directly to. For example, most think of a prophet in the Old Testament, like, let's say, Micah. Micah foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Although it appears there's no way he could have known that, except he'd be given that information directly from God. However, one who simply, declares, who simply declares the word of God straight from the Bible is also, by definition, a prophet. So by definition, there are a lot of prophets out there today preaching the word of God. I'd say that all Christian preachers, all ministers, are considered prophets, although some might arguably, arguably be considered false prophets. But how does a prophet get the information from God to relate to God's people? Well, as we said, it could be by direct revelation from God himself. We particularly saw that with the prophets of the Old Testament. But of course, today, we have the complete Bible containing God's word. A prophet today might just speak God's word from the Holy Bible. So whether a person has a true revelation from God, one that God wishes to be delivered to the people, maybe like Jonah, for example, or whether a person is simply quoting Scripture, the Word of God. He's acting as a mouthpiece for God, and he's also considered a prophet by definition. So if God does nothing before he tells his prophets, what is God telling his prophets before the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the age? So what happens at the end of this age? What's God telling his prophets about the nature of the second coming of Jesus Christ? What's Jesus saying to us in Matthew 24, verse 14? Well, Jesus tells us that something will be preached in all the world before he returns. Now, who's preaching this message? God's prophets. Those who preach the word of God. Not the word or the tradition of men, but the word of God. And what again, what specific thing is being preached in Matthew 24, verse 14? 
the gospel of the kingdom. We're coming right back to Matthew 24, verse 14. But if you would, let's turn briefly over to Luke 8, verse 1. I'd like you to see that. You see, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. We can find that in many places in our Bible, and we'll look at that later, but for now, we'll look at just one. But that preaching of the gospel of the kingdom stopped long ago. Until recently, the kingdom of God was not being preached throughout the world. It was rarely being preached at all. Again, Luke 8, verse 1. And here we find Jesus out with his disciples, and they're preaching. He's preaching anyway. Preaching what? Luke 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. We see Jesus preaching the gospel or the good news of the coming kingdom of God, and we see it over and over again in the Bible. But not many have been preaching about the kingdom of God since. Christian preachers today, they teach about the sacrifice Christ made for us. They've taught about repentance and forgiveness. They've taught about God's love. They've taught us a message about Christ, but not about the message that Jesus Christ brought, the message of the kingdom of God. Very, very few in the last 2,000 years have actually taught about God's coming kingdom. But before Christ returns, he'll spread the gospel of his kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, throughout the world via his prophets. Today, and actually for the past several years, many are now beginning to preach the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. Like those in Nineveh, the earth will be told in advance of God's coming kingdom. So those living at his coming, they'll know what's going to be happening. At least they've heard of it anyway. But for so many years, the knowledge of the coming kingdom of God was not preached except by a few very small voices. But today, it's being preached in much greater numbers. And it's going out to the entire earth in multiple mediums. Even this small ministry, the Independent Church of God's Seventh Day teaches it. In fact, we're doing so today. As you probably know, visitors to our website can leave us comments or give us feedback. Our most recent comment was from Kenya. I'd like to read parts of this comment to you. Now, this is from a pastor in Kenya. Quote, here's what he said. <clears throat> Quote, I've been blessed so much with the wonderful and beautiful work that you do in helping the lost sheep. Carrying one another's burden is what Jesus taught. We thank God for directing us to your website. Surely it's full of encouragement, knowing about the second coming of our King Jesus. We are a church committed to teaching the everlasting message to the unreached and teach the original message. We pray that all the people around the world to have this picture of the true word of God. We are Sabbath observant and holy days. Doing that will be, will, excuse me, doing that will be blessed so much. And therefore, we invite you to come to visit and to minister to our churches in our country, Kenya. We will remember you in your work in our daily prayers as you also remember us in the work in Kenya in your prayers. It's time for true laborers to worship in truth and spirit by showing how faith works with actions. God bless you. To the brethren in Kenya who may be listening today, I'd like to greet you and thank you for your kind words. My point in reading this is twofold, actually. First, it shows that our message, including our message about the kingdom of God via our website, is reaching people, in this case, in Kenya. Which is, of course, exactly what Christ said would happen before he returns. And second, it shows that our brothers in Kenya understand about the return of Jesus Christ and the coming kingdom. They're worshiping in spirit and in truth. In spreading the good news of the coming kingdom of God, we're not alone. As I said before, many have preached a message about Jesus Christ, but few have taught the good news Jesus brought to us about the kingdom of God. Let's look back at Matthew 24, verse 14, for just one more point, if you would. Uh, hope you held your place there, but if not, it's Matthew 24, verse 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness 
unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Notice that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Does this verse say that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached so that people will be saved? Or that they will even believe it? No. It only says that it will be preached as a witness. The word witness here is the Greek word 3142 in Strong's. It's marturion, and it means testimony or to be testified. Now, Jonah gave his testimony to Nineveh, but there was no guarantee that the people would listen or even believe, let alone repent. But God wouldn't proceed with his plans for Nineveh until after Jonah testified to the people. Jonah's testimony went to a relatively small group of people. The entire world might take a few more people to reach. But as in Amos 3 verse 7, we read that surely the God, Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So God won't bring about his kingdom until he tells his prophets or to these preachers who in turn will tell the world. In my early years of church attendance, I never heard about the kingdom of God. Well, at least not about the real kingdom of God. I heard things like the kingdom of God is on the earth right now. I heard that the kingdom of God is merely a feeling in our hearts. But I never heard preached that the kingdom of God is a real, tangible, physical kingdom that will exist on the earth after the return of Jesus Christ. So I'm testifying to you today that the kingdom of God is real. It's a government that will be established here on the earth by Jesus Christ himself at his return. Now some of you may have never heard this before, and others might like to know more about God's coming kingdom. So next Sabbath, we'll take a look at the kingdom of God in greater detail, much greater detail. Until then, we'll continue to pray, thy kingdom come.